Okay, we have here another integral from the MIT integration should be 2015. This one's problem 12. We have the integral of one over square root of x squared plus 25 dx. Okay, you may notice I've already did this problem. I just did this one recently doing a trig substitution. The reason I'm doing it again, I wanna do it today using a hyperbolic trig substitution. I think it's interesting just because in some cases the hyperbolic trig substitution could be the faster way, the easier way. So let's get started with this. What I wanna do here is we want something that's going to work nice and it happens that if I do my substitution, if I do my substitution for x and we do it for cinch of t, well I want to handle this 25 which is 5 squared so what I can do is put a 5 in front of this and then you'll just notice if I square this x squared is going to be 25 cinch of t. And the reason I'm doing this for an integral in this form, we have this identity, if we have cinch t squared plus one, this is gonna be the same thing as cos squared t. And that's gonna be pretty good as we put that inside the square root, and then we're gonna just get back cosh, or absolute value of cosh. So then let's come down here, and we'll go ahead and we'll try to solve for a value for t. So I'll divide by five on both sides, and we have x to the fifth is equal to cinch of t. And then taking the inverse, we just noticed that we have here, we can solve for t, and we get t equals inverse cinch x over 5. And just notice the problems we had the other day inverting tangent is not relevant here because cinch actually is one-to-one. -one. Cinch actually passes the horizontal line test, so we don't have any problems inverting this. So it's actually, even from this standpoint, doing it this way is going to be simpler. And then last, let's take a derivative and get our dx value. So coming down here, we'll have dx derivative of this is going to give me 5 cosh t dt. So we'll just go ahead with this. So for, so for our dx value, we'll bring in this over here in the numerator. So we'll have 5 cosh t dt. And then here we'll have this value for x squared, so we're going to have 25. But what I'll do in one step, I'm going to factor out 25, so I can write this as 25 times cinch. Oh, sorry, this should be squared here. I just made a mistake. So just squaring x here, we get the cinch squared here. So this is going to be cinch squared t here. And then with the 25 factored out, this becomes a plus 1. But then we'll take this 25, take the square root of it, and we get 5 to bring outside. But then we'll cancel this with this here. Then again with that identity I just had a minute ago, this is the same thing as cosh squared t. So then cleaning everything up, we'll just use some space over here. So we'll have our cosh t dt here. And then this square root of cosh squared t, this is going to give me absolute value of cosh t. But now for cosh t, we can just look at this definition really quick. Cosh t is going to be the same thing as e to the t plus e to the minus t over 2. So we're adding here, and exponentials have to be positive. So the whole numerator is going to be positive. The whole thing's going to be positive. And we can just drop our absolute value right here. But then we can cancel cosh t and cosh t, and so we're just integrating 1 dt. Then we'll just go ahead and integrate 1, so that's just going to give me t over here. And all we need to do is back substitute in order to finish it off. So for our solution to this, we just get inverse cinch x over 5 plus c, and that's it. Now, if you watch that other video, you'll notice that we got the solution in two different forms. This was one of them. This was the second form from our previous video. Now, we can also get this back into the form of natural log. Let's just look at our definition for inverse cinch really quick. So we have this definition over here for inverse cinch. The only thing different here is our input is x over 5 instead of just x. So if we input x over 5 into this thing, we're going to have natural log x over 5 plus, then inside the radical, this becomes x squared over 25 plus 1. But now real quick, if you factor 1 25th out of there, you can bring that out as 1 5th. So when you rewrite it, you'll get something that we saw in the previous video that we had. You can write this as like a 1 5th in front, x squared. Factoring the 1 25th out here, this becomes a plus 25. But what we did in the previous video is then once we had a common denominator, we put these two together and we use log properties to bring this over here as ln 5 but then that got absorbed into this constant. And so then we can just express this solution as just natural log x plus square root of x squared plus 25 plus c. Okay, so now there is just one other thing I wanna go over before we finish up. I had this question in the comments not too long ago, a similar problem, it, it wasn't the same problem, okay, so a different problem. So the question was, we have an integral that's clearly positive everywhere, right? Because the square root has to be positive, it's squared, so clearly no matter where we look in this graph, it's always positive. But then for our solution, yes, what's inside here, this is always positive, but with a natural log, if what's inside the natural log is between zero and one, this whole thing actually can be less than zero. 
So the question was, how can you have a positive integral with a possibly negative answer? So let me try to answer that question, but what I'll do is clean up the board and we'll look at a simpler example. Okay, so just keep in mind, whenever I go over here with our very simple example, it's gonna work for our more complicated example. And so we have here an integral that we know we can do, x squared, right, just power rule. But again, this thing is positive everywhere, clearly, because it's squared. If you look at a graph of x squared, very rough. I mean, it can be zero at zero, but it's gonna be positive everywhere else. So I'm saying this is similar to the integral we were working on, just in the fact that it's positive. It's different shape, of course, but it's gonna be positive everywhere. And then, of course, we integrate this, and we just get x cubed over three plus c. And then the graph of x cubed over three, that's gonna be something just real rough, something like that, right? But clearly we're getting negative values over here when x is less than zero. I mean, of course, there's a plus c involved too, but just looking at, just focusing on x cubed for a third, for the sake of the example, we get negative values over here. Now, really, this whole thing is just kind of a misunderstanding because there's a couple different principles involved. First of all, the domain of our solution be the same as our problem. And that's true, right? Because here, x can be any real number, x can be any real number. True here as well. X can be any real number, X can be any real number. So I think the problem and the question is if you're looking at an indefinite integral and you're considering this negative, if you're considering this less than zero, now you're not looking at domain, you're looking at the range. And we don't have that restriction. We don't need the range to be the same for these. So I think that's one misunderstanding. Now I think the other part about this is if you're thinking about a definite integral. So like let's say we had some kind of definite integral over here. This is our this is our x squared here in black. Well, clearly, again, for any def any area, any so for this x squared, no matter what we choose our bounds to be, well, clearly we're gonna have a positive area. And so again, you might be concerned because we got like this negative graph and we got positive area here. So then let's come back to our integral here and let's see if what happens when we integrate from minus five to minus two. Well, over here, of course, we still have x cubed over three. We're integrating it from, we wanna evaluate this from minus five to minus two. So evaluating at minus two, we get minus eight over three here. Then minus, then here this is going to be minus 125 over 3. But then minus and minus is plus. Notice we end up with a positive solution. This is going to be 117 over 3. So as it turns out, where the misconception happened here is even though our solution goes into the negative area, that's not what we're looking at here. So yes, this is positive area. But then in our solution, it's not actually any area under this curve. The solution comes from the difference from these two points. It's like this, this y value, this height. It's based on the slope and this curve x cubed over three is always increasing the same way as the natural log is always increasing. So again, if this is a definite integral using this solution, it would work the same way. And so when you evaluate this, no matter where you do it, you sort of end up with this, you have this positive y value here just because this is increasing. Anyway, so I know probably a lot of people already understood that, but I just wanted to clarify it just because it was kind of an interesting question and something to think about. So there you have it, trig sub with the hyperbolic trig functions. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day.